Hello, everybody. This is uh, Maha Shraddha, and uh, I'm joined today by Sila Jala and Buddha Sevika. And myself and Sila Jala, we're going to have a conversation with Buddha Sevika about, about his condition, multiple sclerosis, and, and how, it, how he lives with his condition, uh, being a, an, a member of the True Ratna Buddhist Order. So it's a delight, Buddha Sevika, to uh, be with you this morning. Uh, we, we obviously have a history, we have a friendship going back many years. Um, and uh, yeah, we've had many, many conversations in this area, but I'd like to kick off today by just asking you, to, it'd just be great in your own words to, to give us a, a brief summary of, of how your condition developed, you know, what age and how, how it was for you at first, uh, how it's impacted your life and so on. Okay, yeah, um, thank you, Mahasrata. Uh, yeah, I was uh, 32 years old. It was mm. 2010 uh, when I started experiencing um, problems with my eyes um, initially. Um, so uh, I developed what's called uh, optic, neuri optic neuritis, which is when, uh, I mean, it can affect different people in different ways. But with me, I lost complete vision in my left eye, um, which has now returned perhaps to, say, 80%. But just due to damage to the optic nerve. But I was also experiencing sort of tingliness in my fingers and um, vertigo. Um, you know, I, I was needing to go to the toilet sort of quite frequently uh, and urgently. Um, and I was getting some pain in my chest and my feet. And I thought, well, you know, what's going on here? Um, so I went to the doctors. The doctor su suggested that it was... I can't remember what it was, but um, it wasn't sufficient to explain what um, what was going on with me. So my my dad at the time decided to uh, refer me to, well, sorry, uh, employ a, um, a private neurologist who, you know, we did a, a MRI scan and, you know, various tests and, and interviews and things. And I was finally diagnosed on December 30th um 2010 uh, and things kind of uh you know i was given a, a heavy dose of steroids a heavy, heavy course because my walking was sort of poor and my um various things were going <laughs> wrong so so those steroids kind of worked to um you know they boosted my body in terms of fighting the uh, the attack which was going on at the time in 2010, I was diagnosed with what's called relapsing remitting MS. Um, so it sort of comes and goes. Um, so I lived with that for a few years, um, having the occasional dose of steroids when uh, my condition obviously worsened when I uh, had a relapse. Um, but um, yeah, so I was continuing to work full time, continuing to. Uh, enjoy family life um, with my partner as well. Um, so it wasn't until 2017 when I noticed a real uh, deterioration in my symptoms. And so I took that to the neurologist at Salford Royal and I was uh, re-diagnosed with um, secondary progressive MS. And so instead of the condition coming and going, um, it's it's sort of a, well, a downward trajectory. So your, your symptoms kind of get worse all the time. And I think instead of it being sort of there and then not, it's pretty much always with me. And um, yeah, so it's been a case of trying to live with that really. Mm. And, and there was a point, wasn't there, in, in your spiritual life whereby you had to come to terms with your condition and ordination. Do you want to say a bit about that, your your journey to ordination and post-ordination? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, um, True Ratna and, um, mm. and this context has been with me all the way through this mm. MS journey that I'm on. Um, and I, I'm very grateful for that. Um, it was actually in 2017, um, you know, prior to the pandemic, that I was getting a bit... Um, I don't know, uh, perhaps, you know, do you remember I was um, buying DJ equipment and just mm -hmm. trying to reinvent myself and 
um, try, you know, just thinking, what what am I going to do now? Now that I stopped working full time, um, I don't think I was in a very good place psychologically, actually. But uh, along came the pandemic, and um, it it kind of gave rise to quite a period of sort of introspection, really. Um, so I was on my own a lot. I did a lot of online retreats at Padmaloka. Um, did a lot of practice, spent a lot of time on my own. Uh, and I think I was seen uh, by my friends in the order as having made quite a lot of progress during that time, really. Mm. Um, so I think it was just the enforced quiet uh, that, um, you know, that, that was really good for my spiritual progress. So I put Buddhism and Tree Ratna first. Um, and yeah, and just uh, went for ordination in February of this year. So uh, yeah, so very uh, very pleased with that. Really. Mm, so am I, Buddha Sadika. So am I. Silajala. Yeah, I'm, there's a few things that came out of that. One mm, was mm. for me. There was, there was the thing about being privately diagnosed. It took, you had to go a private route. That that sound, sounded quite significant. And um, I'd imagine that was, you know, quite distressing, not being able to get the diagnosis. And then obviously good fortune that your dad was able to really help you. Yeah, so being privately diagnosed was just so the fact that I was, I suspected what it was. You know, I've, I've been Googling like mad. And so I, I was getting all the classic symptoms like the eyes and the tingliness in the hands uh, the pain, the hands and the feet and the chest were quite uncomfortable. Um, my balance was really off and my uh, walking was um, noticeably affected. Um, yeah, and also, you know, the, the bladder. Um, so I think my dad thought, well, time is of the essence here. Um, you know, with, uh, with something like this, when attacks come and go, when... Um, when there's a relapse and then a remitting phase, then I think it's good to um, move quickly so that the damage can be minimised. Um, so, so that was the motivation, really, uh, of going private. Um, so I, I can't remember exactly what the, um, you know, what, what the, I mean, I went to the doctors and stuff, but I mean, you know, about NHS waiting lists and, and I think my dad was, was kind of scared about what, what was going on. So it, he just offered to put up the money to get me privately diagnosed. And then once I was diagnosed, I was transferred to the, uh, to the public, um, to the public sector, uh, you know, for, for NHS care. Um, yeah, so it's for that reason, really, I was privately diagnosed. Um, I made a list of all my symptoms, actually, at the time. Um, yeah, quite, quite uh, all-encompassing, really. Um, and, it, you know, most people just see the mobility problems and the crutch that I use. Um, but there's, there's much more than that. Um, so, yeah, it's quite, quite difficult, really. Gosh, there's so much I could unpack here. But I'll mm. tell you what's just come to mind without digressing too much, but it's it, it's the factor that, yeah, you did go private, and mm. that's the kind of thing that the Bioratna Trust could help with, although at that point you weren't ordained. Mm. Um, mm. And so if, if this, imagine that you were ordained, would you, if necessary, would you have thought, oh, I could go to the Bioratna Trust and see about getting some money? Do you think that would have occurred to you? I, I don't think so, no. I mean, it's only recently that I've learned of the Bioratna Bi Trust and the the way in, in which it can sort of help order members. Um, so, but I'll definitely bear it in mind for the future. Yeah, thank you. And I'm wondering, um, well, I've seen something of the impact of your condition and your medication on your ability to practice. Can you say something about how you have managed to practice practice you know uh, within the context of your condition i just have to be really flexible really yeah. um i mean some days perhaps you know i don't get to meditate some days i meditate in the morning or right. afternoon or evening uh, depending on kind of how i'm feeling at the time i mean much of my i mean 
the medication that I take, a gabapentin for the uh, for the nerve pain. Um, but I also take like uh, Isitarpram, which is for like depression. I'm gonna take um, sometimes I take cocodonol to to ease a bit of the pain and to help me sleep. I take CBD oil um, to to release some of the tension in my in my uh, limbs and things and to basically help me relax. Um, and so some some of the I mean like for example the CBD um, even though it's not um, a psychoactive um, it hasn't got a psychoactive element it still it, it kind of it doesn't um, it, it kind of eases a bit of anxiety and a bit of tension um, so I think people use it for um, uh, for that reason really but so so when I meditate perhaps I'm not necessarily um, in a pure um, state you know, it's been affected by um, this. I mean, the cocodamol, for example, if I take it at night uh, and then in the morning I'm a bit um, a bit groggy. But I find that, I mean, it's not the medication really that, that makes me fatigued. I don't know what it is. I mean, I can, I can minimise the um, possibility of getting fatigued by being very careful and ordered and mindful about different things that I've got to do, um, taking care of myself, which is a relatively new thing for me. But I mean, when fatigue creeps up, it's, um, well, as you know, there's nothing you can do about it. It's, you, you've just got to surrender to it. Hmm. Um, so it's, hmm. that, that's the worst thing, actually, the fatigue is. Hmm. Uh, you know, hmm. like, for example, um, I've just been on a retreat the, uh, the weekend, just gone, just got back yesterday and my enforced periods of rest meant that I was um and I had an accessible room downstairs so I could hear all the activity you know in the corridor and in the uh, dining room and things and I I got a slight sense of loneliness Mm -hmm. due to that um I couldn't I couldn't partake in the uh, physically. I couldn't do it. You know, I was lying in bed and uh, lying on the bed, and I couldn't. Um, but I could still hear what was going on. So that, after a while, started to affect me. It started to make me quite. Um, uh, you know, I don't know if you've heard of this fear of missing out. <laughs> this this FOMO thing that people sometimes talk about. Well, I think I experienced some of that. Um, that then passed. Uh, and it was, uh, I mean, the weekend altogether, I think it was good. And it was very much a, a tester of where I'm at at the moment. Because, I mean, even when we went on retreat, Mahasrada, in uh, February of this year, I'm not the same. I'm not at the same point now mm. as what I was then. So it's a good barometer to see how I'm doing, really. So. It's interesting what you're saying about the f- Fear of FOMO is it fear of yeah yeah fear of being uh, missing out yeah I I I think one of the things that I was wondering about was you know yeah yes you you experience some sense of aloneness there on retreat um and I wonder how much you know do you experience a sense of isolation you know just generally uh and linked with that I suppose is you know how aware are people of the emotional side of your condition you know, the, the mental, emotional side, because the physical, I'd imagine, is fairly obvious, I'm guessing, you know. But yeah. Just, do, you, do you find that people are fairly aware? Or do you have to sort of say, I'm not in a good space at the moment? Sort of thing? I, I don't really say that uh, to my, you know, I, I think I probably should say that more. Uh, I mean, I think I've been conditioned over my life to kind of present in a certain way. Um, and I was actually talking about this over the weekend, actually. So, and it's it's not uncommon with MSs, you know, the MS community, for people to present. You know, I'm fine. You know, nothing. You know, it's you know, there's nothing to see here, sort of thing. Um, but actually, you know, when you, if you're really honest with yourself, um, there is quite a lot going on. Um, I mean. 
the fatigue, for example, has a very strong emotional aspect, as I just mentioned. Um, you know, when you when you're feeling like you can't do anything, you you feel like, oh, you know, um, you know what what you know what what am I doing? What you know, I can't do anything for myself here, and that um, that causes quite a lot of um, mental pain, really. Um, but um, yeah, it's uh, but there is a lot of emotional and psychological uh, effects, really, that um, that people don't really see. That perhaps I need to be a bit more um, on it with. Uh, I was even, I mean, when I had this uh, fear of missing out thing go, over the weekend. Um, I was thinking about engaging with uh, because I mean because it's so common. I was thinking about engaging with uh, a neuropsychologist um, who understands the condition and understands the impact that it can have on on people's lives, really. So um, you know, I was thinking about engaging with that. Um, yeah, and obviously my papancha was was going a bit crazy at that point I was thinking um yeah I mean yeah I, I don't know it's, it's just uh, yeah it, it's unseen uh, quite a lot of it is unseen yeah and uh, can I follow on from that Sila Jala uh, I'm interested to to hear d d does that restrict you or or does it um interfere with you um going on engaging with the order in any way you know are, are you comfortable expressing your needs to enable you for example to attend the weekend retreat that you did yeah uh, I mean it's, it's been very I mean the weekend retreat was great um mm -hmm. I mean I think um people know enough about my physical limitations to adapt you know the conditions accordingly I mean for example I was in a downstairs accessible room with mm. its own mm. ensuite shower mm. um, I was given I mean Buddhist Samagama was mm. uh, was you know he, he kindly offered to help me out uh, mm. in doing various things like carrying the tea and you know get getting the food um, you know carrying my bags and things so there was that physical help um, I think actually having, um, I think I, I do feel like that I've expressed myself enough to the order mm. um, to, um, you know, to be able to partake in these things like, mm. um, you know, order days and retreats and things. Um, like I say, physically. Um, and also, you know, with fatigue, you know, I, I need to take into account, you know, can I do this? Um, so, yeah, th this is another thing that happens with me. The uh, my mm, yeah. mental um, proliferation yeah. goes off, and maybe I, I go off on one. I don't really know where I'm going. Yeah, yeah. So it, it really, uh, I don't know if that answers your question at all. It, it does, but it's because because you you were recently on the um, the order convention at Wyndham, and 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 that was locally. We know, you know, your situation, we can put in care and so on. Uh, I was just thinking also of going to, to, to events outside of the region, the local region where people don't necessarily know of you. Mm. Um, do, you do you think that sometimes people can have preconceived ideas about you and your condition? And does that interfere with communication, say, on a retreat? I think I think when people mention MS, mm. uh, they um, they think about wheelchairs and mm. um, walking aids, and it's just, he's going to need some help physically. Mm. So so I think there's I mean because so many people have it. Um, I think a hundred thousand in the in the UK. Um, so pe people tend to be quite um, general with the. Um, uh, the physical um, aspects of things. Um, I mean, such as, I mean, if I drop my crutch, I mean, you know, someone offers, to, someone picks it up, you know, someone offers me a seat, you know, I can, when they can see the um, the visible uh, crutch, you know, they can see that I'm struggling. 
um, maybe they can they can hear that I'm, um, you know, I'm going on a bit, you know, my, I'm slurring my words or I'm, you know, and it is quite obvious or I'm fumbling with change or, or something in the shop. Um, so it's, I think it's quite obvious these days um, that um, I am kind of suffering in this way. But, um, yeah, like I say, maybe the emotional, mental side is, is something which um, it is not really understood all, all that well, mm -hmm. at least, um, mm. well, maybe even not by myself. So I think it's a bit of a, a work in progress, really. <laughs> Uh, and it's ongoing but mm -hmm. I, I do feel like physically my needs are, are met within the order Correct. I mean for example when we went down to Wyndham I mean me and you said driving which is very helpful mm. um, when um, when I I'd, well I kind of the fatigue stepped in again at Wyndham as you know so mm. um, I had to go early mm. uh, and it was my dad actually again who ended up he got the train all the way down to Norwich and then drove me back uh, unbelievably and it was you know when the train strikes were on so there was um so I think he had about an eight hour journey to get to Norwich and they you know we stayed in the hotel together on a Sunday night and drove back on the Monday um so I mean yeah certainly my parents know full well what the um you know what my limitations are um yeah and i'm 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 kind of learning to uh, express them to the order i think mm. more and more i mean to be in close contact with the order is is kind of essential mm. in the due to the fact that my condition is always always mm. changing mm. so um yeah i mean when i was at Wyndham would be different to how i am today and mm different again next week so I think it's good to check in quite frequently really mm -hmm. yeah can I just ask um but say that could do you actually have like regular carers and if so are they in the sangha because you, you mentioned that your dad stepped in you know and that's quite remarkable and also again expense you know which a mm. uh, hidden expense that we you know you might need to pay for that sort of thing you know <laughs> yeah. no I don't I don't have regular carers at all I mean, I live in an accessible um, apartment and it's got wide door frames and it's got a wet room and um, it's quite easy for me to live independently, but I do rely on my parents to get my shopping. Um, the, the personal care is something that I can do myself and that I would want to do myself. I don't think I'm quite ready to, to get the help yet, but... In terms of the cleaning and stuff, um, I do it, but I have to pace myself. Um, I can keep the place tidy, but uh, say cleaning the wet room was something that I wrote my daughter into doing. Uh, Molly, she was, you know, I gave her some money, and she was, uh, she she was um, she was doing that. Um, but um, I don't know what it is. I mean, may, maybe there's a block about trying to employ um, an independent sort of carer. I don't even like the word carer. Uh, um, maybe helper or something, or, or something like that. But so far, um, I've not I've not been uh, engaging with uh, independent carers. I mean, there, there are many things I can do myself. I mean, my MS is unusual in that my right side is basically unaffected, but my left side is... Um, is really affected. So there are certain things I can do myself um, that perhaps other people with MS can't do. Like, for example, you know, sweeping up and things, I'm, I can be on my feet to do that. Um, so, so yeah, I, I feel that my family, really, uh, and my partner, Elaine, uh, you know, when I go to her house once a week, uh, she takes care of me. Um, and yeah, that's how it is at the moment. And that, that kind of feels all right. Yeah, I was just picking that up, that it feels it's important to you that you have this sense of independence and, and not sort of, as it were, add on. I mean, you mentioned Propancha earlier on in the way you could very easily add on, oh, I, I'm not well, you know, <laughs> I, I need this, I need that. But 
there is something in you which is actually I'm going to really do my very best here you know to keep going independently and, that, and that's really important mm. it, for you and also for others I'd imagine as well you know so, so again down to perceptions you know how people perceive you and so on yeah yeah absolutely and uh, I live in a um a kind of well my husband knows where it is I live next door to a, a lady who's got physical disability and across from a guy that has as well and I I kind of I would say that I'm kind of the most independent of, of the bunch, really. Um, I think I might have to um, give that up over time. I might have to surrender um, that to, you know, when, when I really need help. I think I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to have a choice. Like when the fatigue hits, you don't, just don't have a choice. Just have to give in to it. And so there might come a time where I have to give in to it. But for the moment, and day by day, I'm taking it and I'm just just trying to try, trying to um, be as independent as possible. And that also makes me feel quite positive as well. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Marshall, do you mind if I ask another question? No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just thinking, obviously, yeah, like you say, you want to remain as independent as possible, but you're thinking, yeah, maybe I'll have to give it up at some point and perhaps you will need extra help. <clears throat> um, would you like that help, ideally, to be within the Sangha, within the order? Is it, would that be important to you, do you think? Uh, or does it not matter? <clears throat> um, I. It's funny, uh, and this... this could change um I kind of thought my kids might be uh, able to help me out um, I have a very strong relationship with all of my kids I've got three of them um and I thought that they might be able to provide support but also as I, I mean I'm, as you know I'm very new to the order um I think that perhaps my chapter might have a part to play in this um but yeah, it's, it's something that I've I've thought about in the past. I've thought that well, I've got three, you know, family look after each other. But yeah, as I'm um, as I'm getting more involved with the order, uh, I'm thinking, well, actually, the, you know, there's there's family there that I can turn to as well. Mm. So yeah, that that's um, that's an interesting one to kind of mm. think about, really. Hmm. Because uh, uh, the Abai Rattle Trust is is helping uh, local orders develop local care networks. Uh, I think you know that would have can hopefully something like that in Manchester would be able to um, you know just, just step in in a bit in in an organised way, which would give you confidence to know that it's there when you, when needed. And I think I mean I, I, yeah, and obviously there's. Um, there's a connection that we have to the Buddha. Mm. Um, mm. And so, so that's very important. Mm. Um, yeah. And so, so yeah. So as, as I progress through life and with the condition, mm. I think, I mean, that, that's very important to me. And that's, that's a, a kind of context that we share. Mm. Um, mm. I, I don't know of, and I was, rocking my brains over, over the weekend thinking of you know people that have ms in the order so you know ms is a big part of my life the order is a big part of my life mm. um and all i could think about was kamala sheila who mm. has it much much uh, much less than me you know mm -hmm. much more um milder milder yeah um but but yeah, I mean, there are three very important things to me actually. Is, mm. is my fam you know, my girls, my family, mm. uh, my MS, obviously I need to take care of, and the, my spiritual aspect. So it'd be good to mm. try and integrate that mm. somehow. Because I I've noticed Buddha Savika. I mean, you got ordained in February this year, um, and, and since well, even before then, even in your in your ordination process in leading up to your ordination you 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 really did engage wholeheartedly with the sangha the local sangha you set up the for example the mbc uh 
Sangha uh, WhatsApp group, which has become well over five hundred members. It's become very popular. Yeah, it's a Facebook. Yeah, it's a sorry Facebook. Yeah, page, uh, and you deliver classes. So it's like you, you, you're a very inspired man, um, despite everything else. You're you're a very inspired man, and you know you 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 express that in in various ways. And I just want to rejoice in that that. I like you, you, your you know, ordination has a very very uh, strong impact on you, and the Buddha, it, you, know, you you gain a lot of inspiration from the Buddha. Mm. You go yeah. for refuge effectively to the Buddha, and um, and that's where a lot of your, as I say, a lot of your inspiration comes from. Yeah, that, yeah, I do, I do feel that it's a it's a very uh, central to my life, mm. um, and obviously my name, Buddha Savika, um service you know in service of the buddha mm. um I've, I've been you know reflecting on my name uh, quite a lot and there is um there is a natural um i, I kind of want to sort of serve um both mm. you know obviously my spiritual life mm. but my mm. family life and mm. you know th- there's a, a kind of reaching out there which which i enjoy which mm. gives me a lot of um which which gives me a lot as well Hmm. Great. Silla Jala. Well, yes, I, I, actually what was running through my mind there was was something sort of slightly at a tangent, but it's all related, obviously. And, and, and it's that, um, you know, you mentioned there's, there's the three things in your life, you know, your, your family, uh, the MS, I think you said the order, <laughs> the car room. Um, but what's interesting is, is that I'm, it seems to be that you're, one part of your practice is, is not to identify inevitably you know with the illness not to make you know at the same time you can't say this isn't happening obviously because it is so it's quite I'd imagine there's quite a balance there for you you know you need to be with who you are and how you are but not yeah. get tied up with the label and, and identified with it <laughs> well, well I think the um the, the truth is that I've, I've been trying to push it away for, for years uh, and this resulted in, um, I mean, there's, there's not, I mean, people say um, um, I, uh, I have MS, MS doesn't have me and things like that. I don't really believe that because it's so all-encompassing. You know, everything that you do um, has an aspect of that. So it's just always with you. Um and for years, I mean, my house read a nose that I was, I was saying, no, no, you know, this, this isn't me. I, I don't want this. But I think the turning point came uh, when I actually said, well, yeah, you know, it's, it's a part of me. It's, you know, it's something that um, I don't necessarily love having it, but it's, it's what's going on. Um, so I need to try and be with it as best as I can, you know, and, and practice with it you know, rather push against it, just kind of just say, well, actually, um, you know, this is going on. There's nothing I can do about it. And so, so make the best of it. And so that's, so that's kind of, I think that's where the turning point came in the pandemic. I was, um, instead of being really hardened against it, I was kind of softened and, well, actually, you know, you know, the Zoom is great. You know, these online retreats are great. Just what I need. You know, I'm a man now with a disability. Um, I need to adjust accordingly. And, and so uh, so I think that's where the real uh, progress was made, really, when I sort of cultivated a kind of sense of acceptance, really. Yes, yes, very much a, a loving kindness, loving kind acceptance. Do you feel like that's had an overall effect? So being more kind and accepting of how you are and who you are, uh, do you feel like that's affecting your general relationship with other people? Have your have your relationship shifted in some way? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like I mean I was talking about this over the weekend, and my relationship with my partner Elaine has never been better. Um, and I'm just taking into account her her needs and her samskaras and everything like this, uh, trying to just be there for her. I'm, I'm sort of giving out to my, my kids, you know, literally <laughs> giving them money. 
um, but but really um, devoting myself to them. And I feel like I can do that more effectively from my place, um, you know, having developed a, a positive, um, uh, you know, relationship to myself and the condition. I think there is still work to be done. I mean, I don't, I don't, um, I don't, you know, enjoy having MS or, you know, I do have a bit of a rejection of, you know, my body and it not doing what I want it to do. Um, so, so years ago, when I was at Pabaloka, um, uh, one of the ordination team, Paragon there said, you know, you need to start loving yourself, you know, like, you know, you love one of your kids. So he suggested um, having a, a photograph of, of himself as a kid in my wallet that I could just, you know, look at every now and again and just having some, um, having, having some meta towards that. But in, instead of that, I, um, I got a picture on my phone, you know, on the home screen uh, for a while. Um, and, and that, I think, was, um, was very helpful, you know, caring for myself like I care for my... I mean, say my daughter had MS, I wouldn't be um, quite so um, cross uh, that she had it, for example. So, yeah, I, I think there is still work to be done. Uh, I think I need to start loving my body a bit more. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, for example, I mean... I mentioned before that I have a very strong right side that does all the work with cuts and things when the left side is affected. And so when I look in the mirror, I've got a very like muscly uh, right side and a very kind of thin and um, like, um, you know, affected looking left side. So it's, so, it's, so it's how I can love and care for this part that I'm not, particularly um i'm getting better at but i'm i'm not quite as friendly with now as perhaps i could be so um so yeah it's, it's definitely a work in progress and I, think, and I was talking again on the weekend about um and i do have support from the sangha so i could sort of disagree with them but i mean everyone's going on this journey and everyone's getting more and more um you know, old and ill and, you know, and there's a, a tangent, you know, going there. And I think with me, it's it's quite, um, it's quite in my face. I mean, Arthur Bardin even said a while ago at the Manchester Centre that it's like the mirror of suffering is, you know, it, it's not obscure, it's not far away, it's quite, quite close. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in a way, that's kind of arming me for things to come. So when, you know, when I do struggle later on in life, it might not be such a surprise or a shock. So in some ways it's, um, you know, it, it's pretty, it's warning me of things to come, which, which could help me die better. <laughs> Have you, do you mind if I, if I ask about a prognosis, is, is this likely to be the cause of your, I mean, obviously nobody knows how they kind of died of it, but is it, is it possible you would die because of the MS? It, well, MS per se isn't um, considered to be life-limiting. Um, it's, it's certainly life-altering, and it could it could give rise to some other um, some other thing. I mean, there might be a, a physio physiological uh, thing going on with my body, which you know, the fact that I am getting wasted on the left side does have an effect on my organs, for example, and, and that's the thing that ends up killing me. Um, it, it, yeah, so MS um, isn't going to kill me, but I think it's probably going to contribute to my death, uh, which is quite, quite a hard thing to, um, to contemplate, really. Um, I mean, the first thing that I, I wanted to know when I was diagnosed back in 2010 was, um, you know, is it going to kill me? And, um, and when I realised that it wasn't, then I thought, well, that's all right then. You know, we'll, uh, we'll kind of deal with that. Um, there is also, I mean, just while I think about it, I'll just drop in that um, quite interestingly, and I don't know why this is, and I'll, I'll reflect further on this, but 
I've never looked at any like uh, scans, brain scans or um, anything. Like, I've, I've never consciously wanted to know about what was going on with my condition. I just thought, well, we'll see what happens with it. Um, you know, if, if I need help in a certain way, then I, I will get that help. As and when it happens, it might not happen. Um, and I've been reflecting on this actually over the weekend and, and sort of uh, prior to that, that, well, actually, sometimes I just don't want to know. Sometimes I just almost, it's like um, a surprise element there. I even, uh, I even related it to my sadhana practice. I mean, I've deliberately not, um, look, you know, not studied uh, Papa Sambhava in great depth. I mean, obviously, I know the basics, not like um, uh, Charon, um, ex Tom Conley, sorry, I've forgotten his odd name now, Chandra Deepa. Um, I mean, he knows it inside out. Um, so there's, there's um, I think there's, there's, um, there's an attraction in just not knowing you know, not not being not being for you know pre armed with the information. So when anything happens to me, nisadna or physic physically, I'll I'll deal with it then. You know, I, I quite I don't know why there's sorry, I'm I'm probably just gone off on the right tangent here, but I know it makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Are you going to say something there? You know? No, I was, I was just aware of the time, and maybe we should bring it to a to a close. Because, but I say, I'm just, you know, I, I'm aware of your fatigue, and uh, that's probably enough for you, isn't it? Perhaps, yeah. Yeah. We were wondering about earning a living with a Savika, and um, we understand that you do some work for the Manchester Buddhist Centre and the Abhiratna Trust and Buddhafield. Yeah. And um, basically just wondered how you managed to do this with your condition. If you could say something about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I'm fortunate in the, um, in the fact that I can, obviously I work from my desk. It doesn't involve any uh, physical exertion. Um, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, well, it's, that's not the case with everyone with MS. Uh, they call it the snowflake condition because everyone with the condition is, is different. Um, and luckily, my brain hasn't been adversely affected. Um, and so I can, I can still do what I've always done in my career, which is web design development um, and also you know also I've kind of taken on a bit of uh, meditation leading which I've which I've liked doing for a number of years now and so I can do that um, well the Manchester Buddhist Centre doesn't pay um, but Buddhafield do pay um, I do web I do like IT work for Buddhafield um, and uh, yeah, so so that that's the kind of um, stuff that I do for them. Um, in terms of um, what else I do for the uh, Barat Trust, um, I've designed brochures for them um, yeah. in the past, and also I've um, and I'm going to do some work for Mahashrada on the Scarborough Buddhists uh, website, um, which is going to be um, again, obviously, it's desk based. So I'm not going to be um, required to actually, you know, move a muscle apart from a brain muscle, uh, which luckily isn't affected. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I kind of do that within the parameters of the um, the benefit system. They they um, they agree the benefit system, the HMRC, whoever it is, that I can work uh, for 16 hours a week. Uh, without it affecting a, any benefits. It will affect, I think, my uh, housing um, housing credit, you know, my, my sort of council tax support, I think it is. 
Um, but um, in insofar as the other um, benefits go, it, it's not affected. And so I'm contracted to work for Butterfield for uh, 12 hours a week. And that, that work can be done as and when it suits me, really. So um, <clears throat> if I'm feeling particularly fatigued on Monday, I won't be working for them. Um, you know, and perhaps on a weekend I will work um, instead, you know, perhaps when, I, you know, so it's kind of flexible, which kind of suits, suits us both, suits both Butterfield and myself. And because, um, yeah, they're, they're very um, sporadic in the way that they work as well. Um, because, I mean, most of the people who work for Butterfield are volunteers and have like full time jobs. So quite often they can only get to their computers um, at, certain weird times and then I can then respond in my own time. Um, so I'm, I'm finding it, it works well. In fact, I would say that at the moment, uh, I'm in better financial shape than I've ever been in my life, which is, which is weird um, because, you know, I've had a decent career in um, IT, web development and things, um, but my finances haven't always been that organised. So my dad has been very kindly kind of completely sorting my finances out, uh, making sure I'm on the correct benefits, um, you know, sorting all my standing orders and direct debits out. Um, and then, you know, the work that I do for Butterfield is, is on top of that. So I would be able to survive, um, to live, you know, adequately um, on the benefits that I receive. Um, but the work that I do for Butterfield and for Mahashrada will, you know, the, the money will, um, you know, it, it will be, it will be good in addition to that. And like at the moment, I'm, um, I've been saving um, for an advance payment on a motability vehicle, which is due to uh, be paid for in January. Um, so I'll have, I'll have got about oh, well over three grand. Uh, to to put down towards the, that uh, and that wouldn't have been possible in my previous life I would have been relying on you know you know credit you know loan companies or whatever so yeah so I'm in good shape really yeah that that's really all really good to hear um we were also something we wondered about um was that I mean and from what you're saying you you, know, you could have if you wanted have chosen to work you know out in the world, so to speak, but you are actually trying to work, you know, you are working for businesses there within the movement. And is that for you an expression of, you know, your inspiration and feeling for the Dharma and, and gratitude? Is that is that part of it? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I, I think um, I think a lot, right livelihood is quite an important part of my, um, you know, what, what I want to do, what, what I want to be doing. Um, and so, so to work for Butterfield, say, um, is an expression of that. Uh, and, you know, my gratitude for the Dharma and for the, you know, for everything it's brought me, I, I just want to give a bit of that back. I'm not paid a great amount from um, Butterfield. It's, it's minimum wage. Um, but um, that doesn't matter. You know, I'm doing something that I love. Uh, which is, you know, related to websites, you know, for something that I love, which is the Dharma. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it kind of works. And I would also say that, um, yeah, it, it, you know, I, I did spend, um, you know, a lot of years working for organisations which I definitely wouldn't call right livelihood. And so, you know, I was... I was using my skill set to encourage um, greed, probably, um, you know, for, you know, for material things, uh, you know, working for the companies that I work for, uh, you know, mo mostly. I did work for a university as well. But, um, but I, I, basically, I was trying to, you know, get people to buy stuff, which doesn't really feel that um, in line with my... Uh, in my values really yeah yeah and i'd imagine that the connection with 
the fact that you're working for people like Buddhafield and Manchester Buddhist Centre, they understand you, you, there's a there's a rapport there. There's a, there's the friendships and so on as well. So it's much easier to basically you know, for them to understand what's going on, what your needs are. You don't have to sort of battle for any of that as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 No, no, yeah, and, and they're more um, yeah the fr- uh, spiritual friendships. Um, so yeah, so it is supportive in that way too. Great, thank you, Marshadda. Okay, hello, Buddha Sarvik once again. Oh. Hello. Uh, one thing I just wanted to highlight is just how helpful your dad has been, and in, in being able to sort out benefits and and and, and help you uh, manage your finances better. And I just wanted to point out that this is something which the the local care network um, project in a of a biorant trust is is aimed at you know helping local sanghas provide for people in need because not every order member has a family or who can help you in the way which your dad did so i just wanted to yeah the, just a, an importance there of what we're trying to do in the bio trust the local care networks uh, but um i just wanted to you know obviously i know you well but i i spent many years living in manchester and we've got a very um, significant friendship between us and uh, I'm always deeply moved by the support which the Manchester Sanger gives you um, and I wonder if you could unpack that a little you know the kind of physical the emotional the spiritual support which the Manchester Sanger gives you mm. please yeah yeah and um, yeah so so there are I mean the Manchester Sanger has been very um, supportive um, probably the most, you know, the most way, you know, m- mostly ha- they have been supportive um, with the emotional side of my condition, mm. um, which I've really, mm. obviously, you know, I have um, had issues with in the past. Mm. Um, but I've been in a GFI group and then a, a chapter for a, for a good while now. Um, so I, I feel like I can um, speak to them quite openly about my um you know my issues with you know with living my life in the way that I would like to and and, and that you know the way that I need to um you know obviously as you know there, there was a you know a chunk of time when I was trying to do things that I it wasn't good for me to do mm. as such as trying to do things that I used to be able to do mm. so, you know so as well as opening up my eyes to that. And also with the support of uh, Kali and Amitras and yourself, Mahasrada, I've, I've been, it's been pointed out to me, uh, a lot, you know, along with a, a good deal of uh, reflection that, you know, my, my needs have changed, that my emotional needs have changed, uh, my physical needs have changed. Um, I'm, I'm much more um, able to accept uh, physical support these days um you know obviously my condition means that um you know that there are various things now that I can't do physically um you know such as well I mean for, for example uh, I'm going on a retreat uh on the 18th I think to Adishtana um and um yeah on a, obviously I want to drive um but also um I'm aware that it causes me fatigue, you know, and it's not a good idea for me to drive for long periods. So Sri Pakshani has kindly offered to, you know, help, you know, help with the the driving, uh, which I'm grateful for. Obviously, when we went to Retreat Mahasrada, you you helped with the driving there. And to the order convention, you helped with the driving there. Um, so that I, I, I kind of count that as physical support. Um, when I was working around the convention, um, Vishanka was um, taking care of me physically in terms of, you know, getting me onto a, a kind of connecting bus that went through the campus. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, and sorting out my room for me and my bedding, um, you know, getting my, my meals for me and cups of tea. Um, that applied you know, on the a recent Sangha retreat that I've been on. So um, I was given a, um, a adapted room on the ground floor 
and you know various people help me out with various things um hmm. yeah so so yeah i do feel spied in in those ways that's really good to hear i think i think you're a really good example but it's of of uh of where we'd like, for, for example, these local care networks to go, of, you know, the Sangha coming together collectively to support somebody in need. And and I, I know that you live a very active spiritual life and a very effective life as well, and um, and that you are able to express the altruistic dimension as well of going for effort in all the work you do for the NBC Sangha. So, sadhu, sadhu. That was really moving to hear, the Sovika. Yeah, thank you. Mm. I, I, yeah, very touched to know how much support you're getting, how it's how it's actually manifesting, and so on. It's just, yes, yeah, great. It's just mm. yeah, really, really good. Uh, uh, this is probably off record now, but I'm really interested, uh, Brother Sovika, in to you know your emotional needs have changed, uh, how, how, and how how has that? been reflected in your meditation have you for example the metabolic have you do you do it different do you do meditation differently now now that you've got different emotional needs well i, I did the metabolic this morning mm. and I, I um i suppose i was a bit uh, like off um off grid with it in um what i mean by that is that i didn't follow the traditional way mm. i just felt meta for myself and a, mm. a good friend um, and so that that felt that it came quite easily, um, yeah. So so I think I think that's um, it's, it's showing up there. I think definitely. Um, hmm. My my sadhana practice is um, somewhere something which I'm kind of um, like learning. Uh, obviously, I've, I've just um, I only just started with it really. Hmm. So I'm thinking that that might be a, a very good um, mm. support for my, um, you know, for, for, for my life and, and my death uh, mm. when it comes to it. Mm. Um, mm. And I feel very grateful for that. Um, mm. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Excellent. Boston, as we Boston. say in the Midlands. Yeah, that was Boston, that was. Okay, I suppose I just I, I'm just thinking, Marshall. If there's anything you else you'd just like to add, but a savior that comes to mind. If you don't, haven't got anything, that's fine. But I guess while we're recording, it might be. I don't know. It might be something. I mean, just, just, just to say that um, I think, but a you're an inspiration to many as well. Uh, I know that many people in the the Manchester Sangha and your family are. Just, just really, um, are, are very grateful for what you give. So it's, it's not. What I'm saying, it's not just one way. It's two way traffic. Yes, you're supported, but also you give out a lot, and you're, as I said earlier, you're impacting a lot of people in who you are and how you are. Yeah. Mm. Oh, so yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Marshall. I feel like my relationship with my partner has never been better. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, and I think there's a mutual support there. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's, it's very, I mean, out of everything, I would mm. say that that is noticeable mm. uh, since, since um, I'm, you know, being ordained, you know, mm. we, we kind of just connect together more and mm. know what each other needs. Mm. Again, that's that's really touching to hear. So mm. thank you for sharing that. Mm. Okay, so thank you very much, Buddha Savika. Thank you very much indeed. And I hope uh, listeners find this <coughs> this this conversation really useful. And thank you to Sila Jala. So it's been it's been very good to work with you on on uh, on reflecting on questions to to bring to the conversation, Buddha Savika. So thank you very much and. Uh, and I hope you've enjoyed listening to it and got something from it as listeners. Thank you. Buddha Savika, and you're very welcome, Nashwada. It's been a pleasure for me. So, yeah, blessings to you both. Thank you.